state record to see. Yes, sir. The state is ready to see. To the defense record to see. Yes, sir. Right, thank you very much. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we'll proceed in the following manner. I will hear a recommendation from the state and any witnesses they want me to hear from. We'll also hear a recommendation from the defense and any uh, witnesses they want me to hear from, including the defendant. Mr. James Jeff Caesar. Your Honor, it's okay with the court. I would ask for um, Mr. Caesar signing and also signing his brother to um, give a statement before the court, give his recommendation. Sorry, the state gives his recommendation. That is fine. Not a problem. You may call him to the witness stand and Deputy Moore for the floor. Thank Deputy Moore, if you could move, uh, Mr. James, are you going to need this podium right here? No, sir, I will not. And Deputy Moore, if you get a chance, if you can uh, just move that podium back to your normal place. Uh, is the microphone on? Just thank you. <coughs> this is No, it's not. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. That's a no more about it. I'm not going to make it. You may be seated. Thank you. Special right hand. We solemnly swear upon the testimony given to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, for heaven and God. Thank you. Stick your name for the court. <laughs> My name is Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N, Snyderman, S-N-E-I-D-E-R-M-A-N. You may proceed, Mr. Jones. Mr. Snyderman, um, have you had, well, what is your relationship to um, Mr. Buckley, the victim in this case? I'm his brother's only sibling. Only sibling? Yes. Have you prepared a um, victim impact statement for the court? I have. Are you prepared to read it? Yes, sir. Please do so. Thank you. Your Honor. I'm here today to speak on behalf of my parents, Donald and Marilyn Snyderman, my wife Lisa, our daughter Samantha, and Rusty's children, Sophia and Ian. I'm here to share with the court the devastating impact that this crime has had and continues to have on our family. It has been nearly six years since my brother was murdered by this confessed and now duly convicted killer. Virtually all of that time has been filled with extensive judicial process designed to protect this man's constitutional rights. Even today, following weeks of trial and a unanimous jury conviction, we still have another process to permit him to be heard on the sentence to be imposed upon him. On November 18, 2010, however, this man imposed his own sentences on many other people who were not given any such consideration. First and foremost, the defendant imposed his sentence on my brother, Rusty. There was no due process, no reading of his Miranda rights, no defenses to be raised or considered by a jury. The sentence imposed was death, suddenly and violently. This confessed killer did not give Rusty a chance to make his case, to present any mitigating factors. If he had, Rusty would have produced dozens of people who would have come forward to speak of what made him so special. They would have made clear that Rusty was a caring and devoted father. There was no greater purpose in Rusty's life than to make his children's life better. His smile was never bigger than when he was down on the floor with them. Sophia and Ian adored their father. They were a real family. Any suggestion to the contrary is not only false, but offensive. Rusty was a hardworking provider for his family. He worked every day of his life to make sure his family had everything they needed. He wasn't not working at the time of his murder. He was building a future filled with potential that the defendant simply took away from him. Rusty was also a thoughtful friend. He went out of his way to help people, whether they were close friends or people he had just met. He tried to find a way to help you whether by doing something directly or making a connection to someone else that he knew that could move your situation forward. The defendant himself tried to take advantage of those qualities before settling on a simpler method to try to better his own situation by taking his life. None of this testimony was ever heard by the defendant. He simply executed my brother in cold blood with callous disregard for the life he was taking. While Rusty paid the ultimate price the defendant imposed sentences on many others as well. Rusty's children were sentenced to life without the benefit of the love and guidance of their father. It is both ironic and cruel that as a result of the time it took this to bring this case to justice, Sophia and Ian have already lived longer without Rusty than they did with him. Rusty isn't there to inspire them to dream big and then to work hard, harder than anyone around you to make that dream a reality. Rusty isn't there to guide them through the challenges of growing up to give them the benefit of his experience and love. Rusty won't be there to celebrate their bar mitzvahs, to beam proudly at their graduations or dance with them at their weddings. He will never meet their children, his own grandchildren. The sentence was imposed by this confessed and now duly convicted killer with no thought of mitigation, no appeal, no possibility of parole. My parents had a sentence imposed on them that day as well. They were forced to bury their son in a grave on a hill 800 miles from their home this is a cruel fate for any parent to suffer. 
They are left with a void in their hearts and their lives, waiting for another Skype that will never occur, future visits to Cleveland that can never happen. And like many other families that suffer this type of loss, the defendant also sentenced them to additional pain, being forced to delay their grieving for his ongoing judicial process, played out all too publicly, selfishly designed to avoid responsibility for his confessed crimes. My parents sit here, Your Honor, in your courtroom, day after day, hearing after hearing, year after year, stifling their pain out of deference to this process. That pain will never end. It is a life sentence with no mitigation, no appeal, and no possibility of parole. On November 18, 2010, I lost not only my brother, but also a trusted friend, mentor, and confidant. Since that time, I've started my own business, something Rusty would have absolutely loved. The last picture we took together, just 10 days before the murder, sits with me at my desk every day. But it is a hollow companionship. I can't pick up the phone and get his advice. There's no email to encourage me to do a little more, to dream a little bigger. There's no one to challenge my thinking as I begin to face the hard questions that come as we grow older with deeper responsibilities. I will never have my brother to turn to again. That is a life sentence imposed by this confessed killer without a hearing, with no mitigation, no appeal, no possibility of parole. This confessed and now duly convicted killer sentenced us, as well as Rusty's extended family and friends, not just to our horrific loss, but also to suffer the wounds of that terrible day over and over again, recklessly repeating and expanding his lies throughout the process. Again and again, we have been forced to listen to descriptions, both clinical and emotional, of Rusty's death, whether through 911 calls, eyewitness testimony, or medical examiner's analysis. How many times do we have to listen to him die? We have to listen to the defendant and his defense team slander my brother by insinuating that he was a danger to his children. That is a lie. One that the, not only the defendant, but also his pack of enablers should be deeply ashamed to keep repeating. We get to watch the defendant mock our religion by attempting to wrap himself with the look of a devout Jew, one who supposedly understands the Torah, but somehow missed the basic prohibitions of the Ten Commandments against murder, adultery, and bearing false witness. Finally, he has caused this entire spectacle, including crime scene photos no one should ever have to see, to be broadcast over the Internet. The Internet lives forever, Your Honor. So now, when Rusty's name is searched, this is what they will see first. All of this caused by the selfish desire of this confessed killer to avoid responsibility for his actions, with total disregard on its impact on anyone else. <laughs> Earlier this year, the sports writer Ivan Maisel wrote a moving essay on the first anniversary of his son's death. He wrote in part, the death of a child upends the life of a family. It is an earthquake, an upheaval that begins in the epicenter of the nuclear family and spreads outward. Nothing is as it was. This has certainly been true of our experience. Our wounds remain fresh even after nearly six years. Each time we begin to find some healing, some new judicial development pulls us back to Atlanta to tear open our wounds and pour salt in them again. Your Honor, this court can't fix these things for us, and we don't seek that here. What the court can give us is some finality to this part of the process, some assurance that this awful chapter of our lives is finally over, and we can have the space and time to set about the hard work to begin to heal those wounds. Let us move on, knowing that this confessed and now duly convicted killer can never walk amongst us again. We ask you to impose your sentence on him as he did on us, life without the possibility of parole. Thank you, Your Honor. All right,
was one of the few things that was murdered was premeditated and thought out. Mr. Newman spent 90 days, perhaps, or even more, planning this murder. Every single detail of this murder as if he were building some product or developing some process, if you will. He took every step possible not to be caught. Every step possible and every step imaginable not to be caught, even researching on the internet and making sure that he purchased a weapon that could not be traced and even making sure that he paid the individual, going back and covering his tracks, paid the individual that sold him the weapon so that individual would lie and even disposing of said murder weapon. He did everything he could do not to be caught. To add insult to injury, after he murdered Russell Snyderman, he pretended to mourn. He showed up. He had the unmitigated gall to show up at Mr. Snyderman's home, the man that he had murdered, and he spent time with Mr. Snyderman's family at the show. He poured dirt on the grave, which the court has heard testimony of. That is a religious tradition. That is a religious ceremony. And he did that fully understanding, being Jewish himself and being a part of this religion, what it meant. But he did it to conceal his actions because no one would ever think to look for the killer at the grave side. To make things worse in aggravation, I would say that after he did all of these things and after he was caught, Mr. Snyderman, I'm sorry, Mr. Newman then feigned mental illness, and he spent quite a bit of time doing that. And I say feigned or faked mental illness because he has, in fact, been convicted, duly convicted by a jury of his peers, and it only says guilty. It does not say guilty but mentally ill, and it definitely does not say not guilty by reason of insanity. Twelve people have heard these facts. They have found that he is of sound mind and that he is not insane. And I would submit to the court that it is time for him to face the consequence. He has lied to every single person that has been involved in this case at every juncture. He's lied to therapists. He's lied to the police. He's lied to family members, and he's lied to friends. The state would recommend, Your Honor, as to count one, that the defendant receive life without parole. It is in the court's power to do so pursuant to the official court of Georgia 16-5-1, and we would ask that the court exercise its discretion and sentence the defendant accordingly. As to count two, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, the state would recommend that the court give him the maximum sentence, which is five years to run consecutive to count one. And as a matter of fact, I believe by operation of law, that particular offense runs consecutive anyway, but we would ask that the court do so. That is the recommendation of the state. I know the court has heard from Mr. Russell, Mr. Russell Snyderman's brother, Stephen Snyderman, and we would ask that you do that, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snyderman. Mr. Lyons. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Your Honor, Mr. Newman is 53 years old. He has, as Your Honor knows, no prior record. Your Honor, having heard this case twice in trial, is very familiar with Mr. Newman and his history in terms of his childhood, in terms of his education level. I would like to remind the court that he was, prior to this case, married. He does have three children. He has since been divorced from his wife, and his wife, understandably, wants nothing to do with him. He is not available to the defense to make a statement, to testify in court. She wants no part of this family. His children will have nothing to do with him at this point. The support that he has is other than a few friends who have remained on his side and in his corner. His mother, his stepfather, who has been a very important friend, and his sister. He is deeply remorseful and thinks about and prays for Sophia and Ian on a daily basis. He is very sorry for any pain that he has caused to the rest of his parents, his brother, his family, and friends. While we appreciate the jury's attention in this case, and certainly it was a lengthy trial, two plus weeks, and they paid very close attention. Every single day they sat here, we do respectfully disagree with their verdict. The defense team has 
no doubt that Mr. Newman is mentally ill. Um, but again, I understand the jury's verdict. We would ask that Your Honor take into consideration that he does have no prior record, um, given his age um, and Your Honor's um, knowledge that he will serve at least 30 years before he's even considered for parole. I would ask that Your Honor consider a life sentence, which would be the mandatory minimum in this case, and that the five years, which I agree with Mr. Gage, is um, a consecutive sentence on the weapons charge to be suspended. Mr. Lamb, do you want to hear from any family members? Also, did your client want to be heard? Uh, no, sir. And Mr. Newman fully understands this will be his only opportunity to be heard twice in this amount of time. He does, sir. And at this point in time, he does not want to make a statement? No, he does not. All right. Come on, Lord. Deputy Moore, we're in recess at this point in time. All right.